And good afternoon, everyone. We're glad to have you joining us in our conference podcast this afternoon. We have a very, very special guest. Uh, I'm Penny Siaviri, the CEO of PLC Associates, a Scleris Learning Company. And we have invited Dr. Patrick Sullivan, who is leading Liberty Central School District in a number of really amazing areas, definitely a district on the move. So we're so excited that all of the field members listening today will be able to benefit from this great information and expertise. So Dr. Sullivan, welcome. Thank you so much. I'm very happy to be here and I'm, an excited, I'm excited to discuss some things that we're doing in Liberty. Is there a countdown? Well, I think what we should start with is give us a little bit of information in terms of your um, tenure now at Liberty, the path uh, that you went on to arrive in this particular position, and then give us a little bit of uh, detail about your amazing district, please. Sure. Um, my path to education, it, it took a little while to get towards education. So after finishing my undergraduate work, I worked for City Capital or City Group. Uh, for a couple of years, still unsure of what and where I would like my life to go. Uh, long story short is having coming from my parents are both educators and and having some questions going into that field. I, I did make the shift and uh, became a career changer, so to speak. And throughout those experience I've had of working as a teacher and a special education teacher, uh, and there's a reason why I'm kind of going back all the way to to the start. Um, is the importance and understanding and perspective of the continuum of education. So throughout my experiences, I worked in a residential treatment center in Yonkers, New York, and then found myself working at Sullivan County BOCES, which is the BOCES that is our district, Liberty is a component district of, of working with students with um, several classifications and disabilities. So what that did is allowed me to have a perspective of the continuum and then joining Liberty Central School District as the Assistant Director of Student Services, really having an understanding of multi-language learners, students with disabilities, and working with that student population and seeing what supports we can provide, not only for the students that maybe have some more barriers, but for all of our students. And then working in our middle school of having the building perspective has allowed me to transition through each level in this district to get a vision and a sense and understanding of where we are and having the privilege to work with so many teachers and faculty and staff throughout this district has allowed me to get a perspective of what we need and have reference points so we can have forthcoming passionate conversations on how to support the Liberty students and our community. That's excellent. And you know, all of those aspects of your educational path contribute to, I know your very attuned to looking at the entire organization, the macro perspective. And that brings up that great strategic plan that you now have in process. So could you talk to us a little bit about what is in your strategic plan and how did you, uh, as an entire organization, select these particular areas? What are we hoping that this will accomplish? Absolutely. Well, the idea of a strategic plan actually came to fruition when I was the assistant superintendent and Penny, we connected and we had conversations as we were working with PLC Associates for our district comprehensive improvement work. Uh, and the process that we were able to go to with the guidance and the work and the collaboration with PLC Associates really helped us. And what I found in the strategic plan, which I will get into, is we had our ideas and our vision and PLC Associates had their in-depth knowledge and wealth of experience and understanding and we merged our ideas and I think we came out with an amazing product um, an amazing plan right so it's a plan for learning not only in capacity building and an excellence it's everything that we put together that all, all of us have, have worked through so that process consisted of multiple data points or gathering multiple data points so we can triangulate perspective data quantitative data such as achievement um, discipline data, and most importantly, the voice of our students, our staff, faculty, staff, and community. And going through all of those steps and analyzing the data, again, triangulating it to identify our needs, seeing where we have been for the past couple of years, and how do we refocus? We also 
introduce this strategic plan as we were just moving out of the COVID-19 pandemic. So the hybrid learning was leaving, like we were finishing that, we were going into full-time in-person learning. So it was great timing for us in general in a, in, in a very tough situation. So after analyzing that, we realized there are some items that we need to enhance, improve all of us, not just the administration, not just the faculty and staff, but all of us, because it's always a collective effort. Um, so. We focused on four main pillars, coherence, curriculum, culture, and multi-tier systems of support. And giving an overview specifically for the past, well, for the past couple of years, we've always felt even prior to March of 2020, as we all recall, it felt like we had a lot of wheels spinning without much direction. So we really needed to focus on what steps and what can we do and what intents or goals that we can establish that allows us to build our capacity, thus taking that information, those resources, allocating our resources properly to help build our students' learning, academic, and social-emotional capacity. So... We, that's where the coherence pillar, as we call it, comes from, is making sure that all the information and all the steps and all our procedures from pre-K through 12 and our intents are all moving in the same direction. And that's that's an abstract construct. However, if you know about Fullen's work with coherence, there's so many components of that that allows us to be a uh, lead learning organization. And that's ultimately what we'd like to do is, as Reeves discusses that. The next part is the curriculum. Uh, we've had in the past multiple grades in the same building using different curriculum. We have multiple buildings using different curriculums. So a really a, 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 an intent um, was to how do we vertically articulate or align and horizontally align our curriculum. And we have been able to do that. And a lot of the work is mapped out with our strategic plan. Working hand in hand is that is our multi-tiered system of support um, pillar. And that's just ensuring that we're giving each child that steps into our doors, and even when they're outside of the school day, what they need to succeed. Let it be um, you know, remedial support in reading, mathematics, social emotional supports, but a, and language acquisition. Because we've had it, um, we have in multi-language learners and many students with language acquisition needs. We want to make sure we're supporting all of our students. Uh, and also enrichment. We get so caught up with remediation when we think of multi-tiered systems of support, previously known as response to intervention RTI. We forget about the enrichment piece, but we want to make sure that we're providing the chance to engage all of each and every one of our students. And the other pillar is culture. Culture is to make sure in some is we're sticking to our mission and our vision and our values, but also we're saying what we're doing and we're doing what we're saying. And that culture piece is to make sure that we continue to work and strive for building trust among our school community members, including again, our faculty, our staff, administration, but most importantly, our parents and community organizations. So how do we make sure that what we say on these documents that we're doing the same thing? And that's very important for that trust piece because if the students, the staff, the community trust the district and have the foundation, if we look at Covey's work with Speed of Trust, have that foundation, then you'll help build that collective efficacy to strive and work towards your goals. But Penny, I want to go through, as you know, as we are fortunate enough to work with uh, Betsy Connors, uh, is we have multiple layers of planning. And the multiple layers of planning has been refined. We started it, I'd want to say, going into the 2020-2021 school year in the summer. Uh, is As you look back, and there's a great article uh, from Schmoker about with strategic plans, you have to be careful because you don't want to forget about them because they, they can, they're can they such a big picture item. So what can you do to make sure you reach those goals? And 
what we've done here is we, we are a, uh, a TSI school, our high school is, which we don't want to miss an opportunity. So we make sure in collaboration with PLC Associates of um, going through the process to create our district comprehensive improvement plan and also our targeted, excuse me, our school comprehensive education plan for our high school. So every summer, uh, we in spring and summer, we look now that we have the strategic plan, we have that five year plan. We have yearly plans of our district comprehensive improvement plan as our district goals for that year. And then each building using the same priorities has to create their individual building plan. So the buildings are establishing goals that will reach the district comprehensive improvement plan. And each comp district comp yearly district comprehensive improvement plan reaches the goal for the next year that we're, we've established or our intents in the strategic plan. So that's also a big part of the coherence work. And we're actually in the process of how do we enhance our ability to evaluate our metrics and our program management. And again, that's another item PLC Associates is helping us with because there's a lot of things in the air and there's a lot of moving parts. Overall, as we look at Hyphens' work, this is an adaptive challenge. And we want to make sure that we're giving ourselves not only the resources that we're fortunate enough to collaborate and gain from PLC Associates, but things that we're able to have here. So we're all moving in that coherent path to increase our achievement, our students' social emotional well-being, the trust we have with our community, and just helping our students prepare for what's beyond artificial intelligence, right? That's what we are right now. So we want to give those, those skills and using this plan to help us leverage and keep us focused so we're not doing a million things being a mile wide, right? We want to make sure that what we're doing is we're doing it in depth. What an impressive, comprehensive discussion of the strategic plan, all its parts, and how you're moving forward. And you can tell, obviously, all of our listeners that you know your research well, whether we're talking about Hattie's collective efficacy of 1.57 or speed <laughs> of trust or uh, Fulham's four quadrants and the internal external accountability. And that's, that's given, I think, the district such a boost because in your strategic planning process, not only did you avail yourselves of this amazing body of research, but also the plan predicated on quantitative data, qualitative data, and then bringing in all of your stakeholders. So it was well-informed decision-making. We're so looking forward to uh, hearing all about your accomplishments and results there. So Dr. Sullivan, I know that you have a lot of conversations with colleagues and such, and school improvement is certainly an area that we're all focused on. Um, sadly, not all schools and all districts really are able to claim successes there. So as, as you look at school improvement, what do you see as some of the roadblocks or the challenges that schools and districts just can't seem to get through and serve to just stop them in their tracks? I think the biggest challenge what I've seen, especially in Liberty, there was a lot of transition and turnover and leadership. I think consistent leadership is the first step um, to help mitigate some roadblocks. But ultimately, to help with continuous improvement, right? So if you want to look as we've had the professional learning community model um, and the MTSS models, and we've had all these components, and I could say that there's some roadblocks as we're trying to reach our goal, hence why we have this plan to keep us fo focused, is making sure that you're taking the steps because right, we never get to our goal we hope so, but we, we keep striving for the next goal is what I mean, is how do you allow your, your invested stakeholders to gain a strong understanding of your systems, your structures, and your strategies? So by doing so is creating and communicating, which again, communication is always a challenge as well, and that's an ongoing learning adventure, as I would say as you try to enhance communication. So how do you provide, this is what our system looks like. For example, here's our MTSS district-wide system. It falls into, um, it's impacted or influenced by our scheduling, our structure, our committee meetings, and then what strategies, what tier one, tier two, tier three strategies. So first helping everyone 
understand, and that's where we are right now. Like we have an understanding, but since the changes and revisiting some items, we had some great conversations yesterday about how do we reintroduce or resustain our system structures and strategies, even though we provided PD on this. So allowing all stakeholders to get an understanding of it, continuously reintroducing it and um, reinforcing it in practice and in conversations, but also finding ways to sustain it. So if you have consistent leadership, you take those steps of gathering perspective from multiple stakeholders among your school community, right? So I always say this, I don't want to say buy-in because buy-in means you're selling something. I think that's from Simon Sinek who would say that. You want commitment. So as long as you're having these conversations and you explain the rationale of which direction we're going in and you empathize and understand from those who may have a different perspective, but we always want different perspectives at the table because that's the only way that we can get a multiple perspective point of view to move forward. And you explain, if we look at the golden circle, because I'll go into Sinek right now, right? The why, the how, the what and how we're doing it. It might not be in the same order, but those are key components. So if you're not taking those steps, continuous improvement is very challenging. And there's so much more of what data uh, warehouse are you using? How are you analyzing? How are you building capacity for staff to analyze the data? What are your metrics of achievement? What are your goals? You know, so there's so many pieces, but I think overarching, if you look at from the perspective that I have right now in the district is focusing and building capacity on your systems, your structures and your strategies and holding everyone internally and externally. If we go to full ends of the accountability and I have to hold myself accountability, accountable, excuse me, of saying, well, we didn't reach this and wait, my my building team here is really struggling. I need to meet with them and revisit this and help rebuild their capacity or help them clarify because when we walk around the school and we're not seeing X, Y, and Z, why? What can I do to support them? Again, going back to Heifetz's work that this is an adapt, it's an always an adaptive challenge. So continuous improvement is not a technical fix. It's very complex. You're dealing with educators, you're dealing with parents, you're dealing with students and school administrators, and we all know each member of that group are passionate about what they believe in and what they feel. And we have to respect that. You know, that brings up leadership truly in, into focus. And I, I know our listeners would be wondering, you know, how do you talk to your staff when we have faculty meetings or entire district gatherings? Could you share some of the critical messages that you share with your leadership team and them maybe with staff and with families. What is it that you're setting up in terms of what we talk about and, and where we're going, kind of in the in the generic everyday sense? In the everyday sense, so we try to be visible as possible. So we send out communications. We do, if you look at our website, and we have a strategic plan website that we send out. All right, that's one method of communication. Um, and you know, what we communicate is important and what we're doing because it takes time to communicate everything. And that's an ongoing thing that I'm trying to still learn is communication. Um, so we provided an overview from each pillar on our website. You'll see send out um, um, periodic videos to families. I'm providing them updates. Uh, you know, we have our structures where we talk with the administration. We talk with our teacher leaders. We have administrative retreats. And I guess it's important that we have open conversations. Right? If we're not getting the reality of what's happening, how can we ever improve? So when I try to be as visible as possible, actually, I did tally it how many times I visited schools and classrooms this year. Um, started, I started in October 4th and I hit the 103 times mark that I was visible in the building. So being visible and having, I want to say real conversation. So I always set preface conversations with staff where we have our, our formal meetings. We have meetings with certain groups to hear what's going on and what can we do to improve. We have our planning meetings, but even yesterday we had our district comprehensive improvement. And, and I'll say this, it was a passionate conversation. I was given the history. I was very passionate about some things of my expectation. You had other members that other teachers 
that would openly disagree or question some things I was saying, and we engage in that conversation. And knowing that that's appreciated on both ends and respected, and that's the conversation that we want. Those are the conversations that we want to have. So going back to however you communicate or however structures you put in place, you could try to put out the best message you can think of, the best worded message, having the relationships or showing that you truly care to build those relationships with everyone that steps foot in your building um, is really the foundation of communication. So when they trust, again, going back to that culture piece, when they trust what you're telling them is what's happening, then you can have some real constructive conversations to address and or commend whatever's before us, if that answers your question. It's, it's amazing. It's outstanding. I mean, what we're hearing is, yes, you do have in place the formalized structures and we maximize our impact there, but the everyday communication, the fact that you have a number uh, in terms of visiting the, the buildings and being able to go face to face and having very authentic, um, you know, everyday conversations. I think that, you know, again, back to the research, Lenciani and all of his talk about uh, the building trust. So let, let's take it there, you know, because we know that you, as we said earlier, are very attuned to all of the research. I'm not sure that all school leaders at, at this level necessarily pay attention to the meta-analysis that we have out there and, and what, a, what a benefit it can really you know, provide for our schools and districts because we, we want to know if we're sending a, a district or schools down a particular path, it's not just a whimsical kind of best guess. We kind of sort of think this might be a good idea, but it's it's based upon the, the foundational research of we what we know works. I guess I'm bringing in a Marzano piece, but talk to us a little bit about um, how you develop that, what, what what research bases you're really paying attention to, because it's really clear that you synthesize the information and are able to turn it back to your district for things that we need to pay attention to and think about as we plan intentionally. Mm -hmm. So there's, I, I could say, I still remember this situation where I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go into the amount that I read and I, I, my administrators make fun of me because Saturday morning is my morning read time and night time of all different items to keep me. And, and if I'm not reading, I get very, I guess you can say anxious because we always have to stay a step ahead of what's before us. Um, I still remember I applied for a job. I went to an interview and I didn't get it. And I was like, I'm missing something. So I picked up a book. I went to Barnes and Nobles. I said, I need to expand my learning. And I picked up Tony Wagner's A Global Achievement Gap. And I loved it. And I was like, oh, my goodness. Well, since then, I just read as much as possible. So ASCD is great. They have some good information. Um, but for myself, I am actually a member of the American Educational Research Association, AERA. And they have their monthly periodicals. That allows me to stay on top of peer-reviewed research. Google Scholar is a great item when you look and you find peer-reviewed research. I prefer more. A lot of the work that's out there is peer, in books is all based on peer-reviewed research. But I like looking at the statistical analysis and the limitations and all those other items in the discussion next steps just to get an understanding a little bit more in depth rather than saying, according to so-and-so, this is what their research said. I'd like, to, I'd like to learn this. So that helps me stay on top of the education field. As for the leadership field, I uh, have a, a membership with the Harvard Business Review, HBR, and that provides you all of how corporations and private sectors and public sectors, how are they are analyzing in different topics and aspects of leadership. Um, for current events, I actually subscribe to The Economist, and that allows me to stay up to date of what's going on globally, because if we're not globally aware, globally aware, not being a global citizen, then, you know, how are we helping our students become global citizens, right? We have to be that lead learner role model. Um, and I mean, this is all in addition to just a professional learning network that I've created as well. But those periodicals that are regularly at my doorstep, so to speak, because they, they come through the, the mail, are things that keep me uh, updated and informed. For example, I was reading about artificial intelligence um, before 
anything was really coming out in the schools because HBR and account and, and the economist was talking about it, how it was impacting other industries. We knew it was going to come into education and chat GPT learning how chat GPT, you have Google fighting for theirs, Microsoft. Now it's like Microsoft's trying to get a revival since Google has taken them kind of off that top seat years back. So you learn the economy of it and you know, companies like to work with schools and that's just the reality of it knowing that education feeds into education impacts everything else out there and vice versa so those are some ways that i i look to research i am also just to get as a refresher signed up for a, a an asynchronous uh harvard business um school you know leadership lead with leading change course even though some things I've learned, I want to refine my skills and understanding um, and pick up something. It's like when you watch a great movie, sometimes you pick something up the second time that you didn't see the first time. So trying to see if there's any blind spots that I didn't have when I first started learning about leading change. Uh, you know, like I said, going into the Heifetz's work, um, looking at the equity pieces and equitable leading and equitable learning. So always making sure that you're having your professional learning network and having conversations with them and finding books. Cause I do have a book called de-implementation uh, by DeWitt that I'm looking at to help me enhance our steps of coherence. Um, so having those resources at hand and having some great colleagues around you and admitting that you don't know something can be very powerful to yourself and to others where you could really get some doors opened or access to some resources that can really help you learn more than you do right now. Great message to the field. And I'm sure when you gather with your leadership team and, and staff um, around, you know, discussion uh, opportunities, all of this comes up and you're able to present, you know, here's an idea. This is what Cotter is saying here. I heard you with the six elements of change there and what, what that does to really elevate the entire collective thinking of the organization. So as your, I think it was Doug Reeves, right? With lead learner, really putting everybody into that position of, 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 of being, being in the know. So we know what we know empirically every day, just from working in schools, but bringing in that, uh, that very impactful avenue. Penny, you'll get a kick out of this. So yesterday I had the meet with the building that we have and our administrators are working very hard and they're all new to to the building you know it's a it's a young team uh young you know newer team not young in age i'm saying is just some first in administration and in in, in administrative opportunities and leadership um so i met with them yesterday and, and things that we've talked about and i kind of I'm, I'm said to them going into next year here's some here's four things that you know and i know we discussed we need to definitely address next year to to help your building move forward um in addition to that I'm giving you these two reading assignments. You're getting, you know, the work of leadership by Heifetz and then also leading in a time of ambitious reform, a great article that uses the um, a learning frame. So looking at framing theory and I've explained it to them and saying, when we work, you have to understand, I, I'm giving you this so you understand what's before you. It's not some one fix. It's a multiple stakeholder process. And that's why you're going to develop this committee. And when you pitch this and you start talking, you have to understand how do we get that commitment is a learning frame shows that we need a thought process that we all need to learn, right? To succeed. I don't want to hear that. You're just saying this and telling staff, well, the district's making us do that. That's not going to get true constructive change. So every time I have articles and share them, you know, they, they joke with me, which is fun that they do, but, but there is a reason when we discuss some things. Another one is, you know, the administration was dealing with some resistance, so trying to show them this resistance, if someone doesn't agree with it, is nothing personally against you. There's, there's thoughts behind this. So we did a, a reading activity of managing resistance. And there's some examples of why there's resistance and what steps to, to address this resistance and have them provide kind of case studies like we would in a graduate class of, okay, so what's your next step? And it really helped them navigate through it and not internalize why someone doesn't want to do something or doesn't understand the cost versus the value. And, and those are some powerful conversations because as a superintendent or a district leader, 
you know, our job is to help cultivate and, and provide opportunities for our building leaders and our other leaders to become better leaders and, and really make sure that they're finding ways to, um, you know, empath empathetically or altruistically serve our community. Well, I can just say that next time I see you at a state conference, you better believe I have my two favorite books in hand. Okay, please do. <laughs> ready to talk to you. <laughs> so our, our last our last question here as we're you know ending this this great school year and administrators are, are across New York State and the entire US are already preparing for this upcoming academic year. What would be your best advice for how do we start strong, get those critical messages out, put the, you know, kind of flag in the sand and say, ladies and gentlemen, here's where we're going. What what would your best advice be? And I think sometimes for people who might be new to a leadership role and maybe haven't developed the bold, courageous leadership that it, it takes to really make substantial changes and moves in an organization, best advice going forward? Well, I think if you're new, and if it's your first year, listen and learn before you you, you plug ahead. Um, you know, and you agree with this good point allows me to reflect and think of, of what we'll, we'll do and what we'll communicate. You know, we always have a community forum and we try those like those different structures or those di different modes of communication. I think most importantly is evaluate where you were last year. If you don't have a strategic plan, I recommend starting that process. Um, if you don't have any plan for the year, build one over the summer using your teacher leaders, right? Leading from the middle. That's another full uh, point that I have from the governance core. Um, I would say whatever you say or wherever you are, because we're all different pieces, is gather some insight and perspective and let people know that we're here to serve the community and support the community and explain how we're going to do that. So, right, similar to our four pillars, if it was me, we would make sure that we we're going to remind, revisit, reinforce for our staff at Liberty is we're not doing anything new because so many staff have been through so much throughout their 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 plus years of shiny objects coming through is the same thing with a different name. So to let our staff know that we're still focusing on MTSS, we're still working towards coherence, we're still working towards, you know, enhancing our curriculum and learning it. Um, we're still working towards, you know, building the culture that's aligned with our mission and vision and our beliefs. Uh, I think if, if you send a message to let people know is we're here to support you. Don't we're not doing anything new. We're just working to enhance and build our capacity. And we're in this together. Any message with that foundation will be well received. And you need your data points before you start thinking you can make any changes and you need to hear what changes need to be done from your staff because they are in the classrooms on the daily basis in the schools and they let us know what we need so they could do their jobs more effectively and our students outcomes will be more effective. Great advice. Well, Dr. Sullivan, thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure talking with you uh, today and we're so grateful that you're willing to share your time and thoughts with, with our field. I, I do have to say, working side by side to support the important work that you're doing in, in Liberty, it is absolutely a pleasure. Every day of planning is yet another optimistic step forward. And it's so great to see that you're so clear um, and concerted in terms of the goals that we're, we're after. And a, as we go through all these processes, it is going to be everyone involved, all brains in the game, right? Yeah. If you will, all all the way through. Yes, so. and, and Penny, I just want to say, you know, and I appreciate those kind words, but we're I'm not where I'm at or have my perspective on all the things if I didn't have the support from you and PLC Associates. Because again, part of that professional learning network, right? PLC Associates is with that for with me, you know, having conversations with with anyone that we've worked with, with PLC Associates, has allowed us to kind of get on that balcony, allowed me to learn things new 
and even look at things differently because it's great having someone come in with who has perspective from somewhere else or wherever they worked before have seen multiple schools because sometimes I would get caught in just in our perspective and in our history where you need to kind of realize we have to revisit some piece of that history. So I just want to make sure to compliment, you know, you and, and your, your colleagues at PLC associates and, and who are our colleagues for just the support, the planning and just being great think partners. Thought partners where it's at. Right. And to kind of loop back to yet another research piece, it's it's that last quadrant of, of Follins when he talks about the internal capacity and accountability in the external. So in many ways, I felt we felt very privileged to be part of the external forces that you pull in from time to time. We team together and our two thought partners. So again, Dr. Sullivan, I thank you very much. All the best to you and to Liberty moving forward. Thank you. Thank you.